Not especially. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I think there's a song about that. Nobody called. Um, I haven't heard anything about uh, the cold dust survey that we were doing, and I thought that was going to be for a year, and I thought that was springtime that we started that. Wasn't that right? So I'd like to have an update on that, if we could. Sure. And I hesitate to bring this up, but not enough that I'm not going to bring it up. I, Mr. Uh, Riddick came and spoke to us one time at school board, when I was on school board, and he said, deja vu all over again. <laughs> And I just got to bring up trucks on Hampton Boulevard again. And whether there's anything we can do. I know the interconnector is going to be done when? You know, 18. Probably, yeah, at the very 17. beginning of 2018. So at that point, are we going to officially ban trucks from Hampton Boulevard? Who are you looking at? I'm looking at Bernard, because <laughs> Bernard, Bernard told me, you, all kind of you know, intimated. at the time I first brought it up, all did 10 years ago, that we couldn't do it because it was a state road. Yeah, it's a federal highway. Right. It's got a classification classification under the federal government. Right. Um, that in order for us to restrict trucks on it, you have to get the federal highway approval for a safety reason. And do we anticipate doing that when the interconnector is finished? Don't look at me. I mean, I'm the thing. Well, I mean, I'm just going to bring up the fact that our underpass is not suitable for a truck to be in the right-hand lane. And not infrequently do I go through the, the um, underpass in the left lane, and a truck just veers out into my lane because they can't fit under that underpass. And if that isn't a safety hazard, I don't know what is. And it, at what point do we just, I mean, this is just Terry, getting the, ridiculous. The, the intermodal connector right. is slated to take maybe eight or 900 trucks a day and what, not, do we, what do we have now? Oh, I, th I mean, that would be about one a minute. We have a lot more than that. I mean, during the working oh. hours. But, I, you know, so that's just a partial relief. The Midtown Tunnel is going to handle a lot of the traffic to push it through. <coughs> but, uh, I, you know, I think it would be very reasonable to start discussions again about, about all of that. And, and I think if we came in here one day and just said no more trucks, you'd probably wind up you know, facing some legal hurdles, but if you've got everybody in a room and tried to moderate it and then back it down and then stop it, you could probably get a time frame. Well, it also, I think, to push it would maybe emphasize again how little support we get from the state, from what the courts um, produce as, a, as an impact on our roads and our safety and our real estate assessments. I mean, I think we can go on and on about that, and I by no means want to provide a vehicle that pushes them to Cali, which they can't do, or to Tidewater. I'm not, you know, but I just think at some point we need to have a discussion. The tr trucks are not monitored. The speeding, I think any of us that do Hampton Boulevard know speeding of the trucks is really an issue. And um, I see those houses for sale up and down Hampton. And, you know, who wants to buy into that? And Terry, it's a speeding problem yes. across the city, um, not only for Hampton Boulevard, um, but for Tidewater Drive, Virginia Beach Boulevard, um, Princess Anne Road, where you have a residential area. Um, and the, the speeding, it's, it's not recognized whatsoever. So maybe we could have a discussion overall about the truck routes within the city itself and see how um, that's coming along and what um, we have in place to address uh, the, the speeding issues. I mean, is there a vehicle that, I mean, how do you all feel we should best present it or does nobody else? I, 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 I feel what you feel. It, it is a problem there. I was uh, council on the way to uh, I don't know why they're going to get on 564 and go around and they won't get on trouble. They ain't going anywhere. That's a bunch of hogwash. I said, why? Why? Well, they're, the because they're crosses. creating 22 new gates at the north end. Oh, my God. Right. And they will have a direct, you, lady. direct uh, access <laughs> to these He's coming smiling. right out of the gate, right on the right 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 yeah. so that's But that's at the south end of the gate. Well, and, I, you know, I know that. I, and well, I, maybe I, we ought to come and get everybody to get a demonstration. I'm going to say you're at Sam's You know, you're right there. 
I, I mean, that's that's the same around. And I, you know, I had I met with John Reinhardt during my, you know, discussion used to be. We don't want to start immediately, but you know, if you stop, you talk about they run after hours. Or, I mean, if you just sit at Princess Anne. Hand Boulevard through three light cycles while a tractor trailer is all the way across the, the, uh, the road in the intersection. I get called a month, but uh, I, I don't know why if they don't use terminal. I mean, if they are going to use plastic, the argument is that they can take a right and be on Hand Boulevard. And by this miles. time next year, the Midtown Tunnel will be open too, by the way. So. Yeah. But if they stop them for speeding, then they back up everything. But but even with the midtown, doesn't get us past the safety issue, the speeding, the underpass. I mean, um, it really is a problem. I mean, those trucks are are not. I mean, that road is not suited for trucks. So I mean, am I just Don Quixote here again? And I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> I am. Andy's telling me I am. Well, you stop smoking and. You know, so yeah. Well, that that that'll start. be next month. We'll talk about that too. Yeah, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying these out one at a time. Just like you started, just like you stopped smoking in all of the restaurants. Right. This is well, a start. Anyway, you know. I I just think I well, agree with you. And you know, when we I, had and when we had Isabel, and that tunnel was closed, and I recommended then that we <laughs> you know keep them off of Hampton Boulevard, but nobody listened. And here we are again. You're right. That was but that was a perfect, perfect opportunity. opportunity. Perfect to get that done. Okay. So maybe you could come back with us about some kind of discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you know, and I will say, last time I say that, these trucks are there for a purpose, by the way. They're a huge part of our economy. Okay. So there has to be at least a balancing of some of that stuff. So, but maybe the balance is well too far. Um, at Coleman Place Elementary School, they're um, experiencing a problem with um, the ice cream trucks coming out to the schools um, during instruction time, um, right before the children um, get out. And a couple of the grandparents um, have emailed me and, and gave me a call about what we could possibly do to, to help them um, with the ice cream cup um, trucks. They come approximately at 2.30. Um, in the afternoon, school is not out until 3.30 in the afternoon, and they have the music going to entice the, the children. And uh, once the children are out, there's this street that they have to cross to get to the ice cream trucks, um, and some of the parents are, are really concerned about that. Yeah. Um, the other um, interest is the underpass on Virginia Beach Boulevard. Um, if we could possibly check the lighting as well as the cleaning of the underpass um, and driving around the city, it looks like it hasn't um, received uh, any type of upkeep at that underpass. It has a lot of dirt and grime on it. So, and a lot of our scholars coming from uh, Booker T. Washington High School as well as um, Ruffner Middle School used that underpass as as well as families. Thank you. My um my only concern today is um something that we've seen uh, two times and in my opinion two times too many and that's where planning is concerned. First we had the young lady who got taken down the rabbit hole with the business for um, special occasions, special events. Then we had Omar coming here last week with the situation where, or the week before last with the situation where he was proposing a, a business with no parking. And I don't think that we should have these people go through these exercises in, futil in futility because to come to us for it even to get past planning to a point where it would come to the council for you to have a business that seats 200 people and there is zero parking, that should have never gotten past planning to me. And the same thing with Krista and her business with regard to the ACU zone. It should have never, ever happened. 
And so I think that we need to make sure that whoever is taking these applications, whoever is advising these people in planning or economic development or a combination of the two or whatever, that they're making sure that these are viable projects when people come to them with these what-if scenarios. I know we want new businesses and we want to be friendly and all that kind of stuff, but this is not good. And then they come through, they go through all of this, they incur expense, they buy buildings, they do whatever, and it's either a big hullabaloo like Christus was, or it's no, because it makes absolutely no sense with regard to the parking situation. I just don't think that, I don't know who dropped the ball, I don't know who was at the switch, I don't know any of that. But I know that somebody has to be responsible in telling people this is not a good idea because X, Y, and Z. And I, I mean, we've seen it twice already, and to me that's too, too, too many times too soon. So whoever's handling that when it first comes out there needs to be a better gatekeeper for lack of a better word, or know the rules better, or know the ordinances better, or something or another to keep people from going through this and then you know, having a situation that then the council has to handle and a newspaper gets to write about. There are complications with, with both that you just said, but in each scenario, um, you're exactly right. Whenever there's something that we should be in control of, we should do the best we possibly can. I believe in last year's budget, we voted on money, and it may have been through a state grant, to look at the timing of all of our signals in the city. And I know uh, Mr. Riddick brought up about the roads, um, but I I'm also concerned about being able to get through the city of Norfolk. When I left uh, my school to get here for um, uh, Uncle Pete's announcement, the um, I, I got stopped at five lights going down Tidewater Drive trying to get here. Um, and it just seems like I was sitting and waiting and not moving. In the morning when I leave East Ocean View to drive to work and I go down Little Creek Road and Tidewater Drive, I hit seven or eight lights um, coming up there. And cars are not moving. They're not, people are not allowed to get to places. And I'm just wondering what the status is of the re-signaling and the timing of our lights. Um, and how that's going, and maybe a, either a brief or even a presentation on that. Does anybody else feel that way, like you can never get through Norfolk? I mean, I just... Hampton Boulevard. Hampton Boulevard. Yeah, and just, I, I understand we don't want to create speed zones, you know, with lights, but people got to move. People got to get to work in the morning, and nobody wants to leave 45 minutes before they get to work, and you only work 20 minutes away from where you you know, uh, live, and I think we, we need to just kind of see where we are with that. Um, and then the second thing is the uh, commercial properties, retail properties and landscaping. How much control do we have as a city when it comes to um, having businesses, particularly new ones? Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Chesapeake Boulevard and Little Creek Road, where CVS is brand new and Wawa and the Shell gas station and the Rite Aid, all four of those properties have grass growing out of their uh, mulch. They're, um, they, they're not maintaining the verge, which I believe they're responsible for, even though it's technically city property, just like a homeowner has to uh, maintain that, that part. But what are we doing to hold these guys accountable? They're not picking up litter that's getting trapped in the bushes. They're not hedging. They're not hedging. Um, I mean, Barkley will have a little bit more time. You know, maybe he can help us in put you on code patrol with landscaping. Well, he'll get the contract. Yeah, he's going to say, he's not doing it for free. That's right. <laughs> but I, I know, I know Barkley and I, we harp all the time on, and maybe it's because the city doesn't do the best job on our own property, so maybe they think they can get away with it. But just go to that intersection, it touches a couple of our wards, and look at the, the landscaping of these places. Uh, and I brought up, you know, as well, you know, like the new Burger King at, at uh, on Little Creek Road by Sam's Club. It was voted on under Terry's rule for trees, you know, that you've got to have a certain amount of trees. I, I call it Terry's rule, you know, for, these, the, uh, for landscaping and the drive-thrus. But when a car takes out those trees and they don't replace it, are we going back over to them and saying you need to replace that tree? Or if a sign gets knocked down and they don't replace the sign, or not maintaining the landscaping that was approved by us. These are the, the things that I, I think that um, 
we've got to start looking at to make our city, you know, shine and look really good. And I just, I know it's high grass season. Um, just driving down some of my corridors, I'm seeing a lot of commercial properties with grass that are over a foot tall. And, uh, and they've been like that for a month. I know it's rainy season, it's harder, you know, I, I have a hard time even getting out and cutting my own grass, um, you know, uh, on a regular basis. But we still at some point have to hold these people accountable. And uh, I'm hoping that we're stepping up that code enforcement and going after that we've, we've added positions, but we really need to, and we need to take the money that we collect off of it and use it to hire more people that maintain our own landscaping. We, so, we talked yeah. about it, you know, I work in like 14 municipalities, all of them have a good plan. If you take 7-Eleven on Princess Anne Road, they, they planted trees past and they cut off two crepe myrtles right at, you know, three feet above the ground. Once we're through, we never go back. They, they don't take care of them. We talked about having they, they, every uh, Hampton, Newport News, they have somebody come back to the to the owner of the commercial property and says, you know, these trees, a lot of our people plant them in the trees. Sorry, I'm going to pull them out in the week anyway. So. The 7-Eleven in front of Home uh, Depot uh, took out all those pine trees that they had planted, which right. was required under our... They plant them and we're not looking. I mean, we talked about having a paid position, staff in the position to go back you know, a year, at least a year. Some of them, the minute they get their certificate of occupancy, they're out of there. Right. And we did add some additional positions to the budget this year to address some of those issues. So I think maybe what would be helpful, instead of us keep on bringing it up, is maybe uh, an update every once in a while of how many citations have been issued. Um, I know that they keep that data um, and letting us know that it's actually getting done. I know they don't put the actual citation on the outside of the business. Um, maybe we need to start doing that. Maybe we need to start shaming them and putting a stake in the ground with a citation on it in front of it. Um, but, you know, maybe some data would help us, you know, seeing how effective it is. Maybe we need to have, have two people that are doing it. That's maybe, it. Maybe we should have a stipulation when we give them the uh, ordinance that says, you know, that it's dependent on how you're being checked and they maintain it. I mean, we ought to be able to put that in I right think it, at I the think beginning. it is in there, but I don't think we Follow up. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, we're going to. Hold on, can I, when you talk about signals, over by um, Chesterfield Heights Academy, the light there at the, it's the light at the um, light rail, the interstate. I mean, there's like three lights in a rock throwing distance. And they're all timed up, jacked up. And the schools, the, the, when the kids are getting out of school and the buses and all, it's just a hot mess. And so I'm glad you brought that up because I had it in my notes and I didn't have my notes with me. So the, we need some kind of um, timing regulation or something over there. And in the mornings when people are trying to go to work, it, it's just a mess. Yeah. Maybe we need an ordinance to make sure all of our traffic engineers live in Norfolk. So we're gonna we're just gonna read this and then we're gonna go get our food and we'll come back in and eat during the closing. Okay. Okay. I move the members of council assemble and close meeting on May 24, 2016 at 4 55 p.m. for the purpose set out in clause. And clause 1, 7, and 29 of subsection A of section 2.2-3711 of the Freedom of Information Act. That is one, discussion of appointments to boards, commissions, or author and or authorities. Seven, consultation with and briefing by the city attorney regarding one legal matter regarding a suit quieting a title. And 29, discussion and briefing on a grant where a discussion in an open session would adversely impact the bargaining position of the city. Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Protegiro? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigel? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. Mr. Frame? Aye. <coughs> okay. That we had discussed in the previous month, and it will be building a connected city. We have Stephen that's coming back. Uh, Short-term rental, smart processing, and Vision 2100. On Vision 2100, we're attempting to do something different tonight. We're calling it uh, First Look where um, while I think sometimes you enjoy hearing a presentation, but uh, we think there may be some opportunities to get information to you in video format. So uh, the Vision 21 presentation will be one of our 
reverse attempts at a, another way of getting information to council. So, um, but before I turn it over to Stephen, there's one pop-up that I'd like George home with. There's one item on the agenda tonight. Thank you. That um, we just wanted to talk about briefly before you go upstairs. One item. Valentine School? Yes. Um, so um, that, the, uh, the Ballantyne School comes to you all with a recommendation for approval from the Planning Commission. Um, it was one of the longer public hearings that we've ever had at the Planning Commission. Um, and the discussion had absolutely nothing to do with the rezoning and everything to do with the location of a basketball court. And I think we have a, a diagram that shows where the basketball court is. Um, so the existing basketball court is going to go away when this is developed. It's currently sitting right about here. This area here was identified um, early on as a potential location. Um, this is not part of the rezoning. This is all that you're asked to look at tonight. Um, and the issue about where the court goes is entirely part of the LDDC, which you all will consider at a different time, and it won't be the planning department standing in front of you. So we That's are just voting, voting on the rezoning that has nothing to do with the basketball court? The rezoning means this basketball court that's here goes away. Where it, whether it is replaced, and if it is, where it goes is part of the LDDC. It's not part of the rezoning. What is the LDDC? What is that? The Land, the land disposition, disposition Disposal Contract. Development Contract. It's Development the contract. sales contract. Yeah. So, okay, now this proposed place back here in the back, how well lit is that space and how visible is that space because I'll tell my personal opinion basketball courts can be good or bad just like uh, playgrounds and things like that if they're in locations where they're not well lit they're back off of uh, you know a road where people can't see them or whatever they become kind of havens for all kinds of interesting activity um, but this particular court where it is seems to me like it's in a decent location because it's easily seen from the street it's well lit you know, nothing interesting, very little that's interesting can happen without it being seen from the street because it's perfectly in view of the street. So how does this location compare to the new location? Uh, again, just so we're clear. You know, if you want to keep this basketball court, then you need to deny the request to rezone. Because once the rezoning takes place, this all becomes residential development and that basketball court goes away. The question as to whether it's moved to here or something else is placed here or a basketball goes someplace else, that's really not part of what planning is talking about tonight in the rezoning. That's repos and, um, and others. Um, as far as this, you have in front of you petitions from residents, some of whom think that that's a great place for a basketball court, some of them think it's a horrible place for a basketball court. Um, in, in our mind, it's not part of the question about whether this becomes housing. But my, in my position um, is to eliminate the basketball court, period. Um, <coughs> basketball courts can become, become headaches you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, washing cars, loud music, and all of that. And if somebody has a mortgage there, then, you know, it's a turnoff. I would like to see something softer, like a tennis court. You know, it has less of an impact. And and I mentioned this, I don't know who I was talking to, somebody in planning and uh, commission or whatever, but uh, basketball courts can become a headache. Uh, one of my questions is, with this developer, how much land does he get? Where does his land to stop in terms of the lake that's there and open space? How much control would he have over that lake and the open space, if any? Yeah, he would not, he wouldn't have uh, Just the control over the lake. That's his footprint right there. Right. The developer's line is here bounded in red. Uh -huh. Now that this, top, this that, is that si top this red, is, is that, where's the street? <coughs> where's the street? Uh, it's bounded on three sides by streets. Uh -huh. But the street that runs below the property. 
that runs parallel to right Princess Anne Road. What street is that? Where is that? Uh, let's see. This is. We work I mean, Valentine. So no, it, it this runs. This is Valentine. Yeah, yeah but it would run. There's a street parallel that goes to through there, and, and it would run parallel right to Princess. Parallel. Yeah, it's this one over here on the left, left. side. Yeah, and that's the one that would run parallel to Princess Anne Road. Okay, so he no um, his property, you know, he would have no control over the lake and all of that open space that no, goes over. No, no, this is this piece of property is what the developer would control. This is. No, I just said we're trying to keep this as separate in terms of this is again for the for the uh, zoning. Uh, we're going to have a community engagement piece with the, with the residents in terms of, you know, basketball court, no basketball court, because again, it's 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 their uh, it's their community, and we'd like to do it that way. Okay. So again, we are uh, working with uh, Councilmember Johnson and really uh, putting together a, a community engagement to talk about that part of it. And uh, we've shared that with uh, Mr. Aswan, who's the, the president of the, the Civic League there. But uh, these are separate issues. This is the only piece of it, okay. and. Just like you do anything else, you need to have a conversation. Okay. Uh, get all parts of the table to talk about uh, how we're configured the court and those kind of things. Okay. Good evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity tonight to provide you with an overview of the progress being made by the city of Norfolk to becoming a connected city. Um, I'm excited and I want you to be excited that we're leveraging technology to enhance the community's quality of life, to bring economic development to the city, and also to facilitate a well-managed government. Tonight I'd like to talk about three major areas where I believe we're building a connected city and can, can continue to build on that. One, we will expand uh, our broadband accessibility and capability, and we'll talk about that project a little bit uh, later in the, in the brief. We're going to increase access to public, free public Wi-Fi, and we'll continue to support our smart city initiatives. And the City of Norfolk is leading the region in tr technological innovation in a number of areas. We're going to become one of the first cities to provide free Wi-Fi in public venues, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the future. But also, we've also had broadband capability to our critical city infrastructure for over 10 years. Many cities are just now uh, getting on that bandwagon and beginning to do that. So we're going to talk about that. Yes, ma'am. I have a question, because we had someone come to us from the library board that asked about additional bandwidth, and now we're talking about free Wi-Fi, right. and maybe it's just my ignorance on the difference, but what's the, I don't understand how you need more bandwidth and how the free, how the Wi-Fi, how does that all connect together? So there, there, are, two, there are two separate issues. The, the broadband high-speed internet is the connectivity of the city's infrastructure, and so we are connected to all libraries. I'll show you a graph in a few minutes, but we're connected to all public libraries. But for several years now, the libraries have been providing pre- uh, free public Wi-Fi access to residents, which is more of an air-type transmission to cell phones and whatnot. So one is for inside the library, but they're all connected because eventually your Wi-Fi is connected to an Internet point. So I'll try to uh, talk about this as we go through. Um, so you all know that increasing accessibility to broadband or high-speed Internet is important as we move towards more complex business uh, solutions and processes, particularly if we were to go after biometric and medical and uh, advanced manufacturing uh, industry. I, I wanted to talk about a few um, critical um, descriptions and definitions before we go into the brief that will be helpful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention speed, and, and really I'm just talking about a measurement of how fast data is transmitted across the system, whether it's internet or wireless or, or otherwise. And so you'll hear terms out there like gigabit, gigabyte, gigablast. Um, what's important is the Federal Communications Commission defines broadband or high-speed internet as 25 gigab gigabits per second. And I'll talk about that as we go through the, the brief. And to your point, the a lot of times we've equated internet with cable fiber above ground and above ground, but today we're even looking at Wi-Fi 
and, and other wireless uh, type technology. So the city will be able to increase this accessibility by expanding the existing capacity that we have with our current uh, broadband internet. We'll be able to increase and are increasing the number of com uh, competitors that are coming into the region. And again, we'll increase the use of free public uh, Wi-Fi. So how do we determine the appropriate speed as a user? Um, what, what speed does a user need? Um, again, I defined uh, broadband high speed at 25 megabits. The, the average user in a home that's, that's emailing or web uh, searching or things like that is going to use much less than 25 gigabits. But as you go up this needs continuum, you're going to see that for the kids who are doing video streaming, they're going to need at least 50, 50 megabits of, of speed. The average residential uh, home today is using between 1 and 200 megabits, and that's because they're using multiple users and uh, they're doing online gaming and stuff like that. Um, currently, Cox in our area is only providing about 300 megabits as the top speed for, for a home. Um, you'll begin to get into high speed, super high, ultra high speed when we look at one gigabit. The city currently um, will be moving to one gigabit uh, of internet connectivity uh, on, our, on our network. This is extremely fast, and, and in reality, most homes are, are not going to use that, that level of, of service. So, as a municipal government, our first responsibility is to provide connectivity to our mission critical facilities and providing services to, to our residents. So the, as CIO, that's my, my first role and responsibility. But there are a number of other things that we can do to provide broad, broadband and other services. So some things the city can do is we are in the process of renegotiating the Cox Franchise Agreement for municipal services. Again, um, what we can influence is the fact that we pay for certain services, we, we lease um, uh, cable and fiber, uh, we can renegotiate our right-of-way um, responsibility, and we can talk to them in, in about um, educational channels. One of the most important things we're going to do, and we'll talk about the project that you funded in a few minutes, is expand our fiber infrastructure. Fiber in the ground in today's world is an asset, and we can leverage that. All the fiber that we own reduces our dependency upon commercial vendors, it reduces our cost, and it actually provides opportunity for us to lease back to other uh, companies that might be coming in, into the city. So that's a real asset that's important to the city. And of course, technology is changing, um, doubling every three years. Um, we want to be on the cutting edge of, of, of this type of environment. And I will say, it's my understanding that this was the first city council to go paperless in the region. So, I mean, even uh, years back, we've been doing uh, doing smart things, um, and we we're beginning to talk to vendors about the new 5G technology, which is the uh, high-speed uh, wireless, where you'll be able to get that one gigabit we talked about right on your cell phone. Like, what can't we do? And we talk cannot do. We talked about this the other week, but we cannot set internet and cable rates for residents and businesses. And we certainly can't override service provider business models, but we can do a lot. Um, I wanted to call your attention. There's been a lot of conversation about rates. Uh, if you remember from a previous slide, I said the average household will use between one and 200 uh, gigabytes bits of uh, speed. If you look at the, the regional rates that the two major providers are, are providing here in, in our region at 150 megabits, you can see there's very little difference in price. Um, I will say that Cox uh, is looking at bringing the one gig, you've heard about Gigablast, uh, into the city. The, the, the issue is Gigablast is only for new construction areas because of the technology. Um, and w but we will have the first uh, Gigablast site in Norfolk at the Watermark Development in Ward's Corner coming uh, during the summer when that project fire, fires off. For the rest of the residents in the city, uh, Gigablast or one gig will be over the next two years as, as Cox um, modifies their, uh, their technology. So that's kind of the timeline that we're looking at. Um, there are other alternatives, uh, non-broadband rates for uh, underserved areas. Um, uh, Cox has a, a program um, for low-income families with children in K-12, 
it's fairly <coughs> low speed, uh, 10 megabits, but it would, you know, it would suffice for, for email and, and, and web browsing. But we're going to talk about some alternatives where I think we can help residents as we move would through that the be brief. The contract that we're doing with uh, um, that would be one of the areas I think that we would we would look at. It's in the current contract. The um, area where we have the, the families with children in K through 12, we already have that contract, that understanding with Cox now? Yes, ma'am, it's in okay. the contract. Do we have the data um, that shows us how long we've been in um, partnership with them, Norfolk Public Schools and Cox, and what the impact has done then? How many families have taken advantage of the partnership between Norfolk Public Schools and Cox? I, I could get that information from Cox. I don't have, I don't have the data. Okay. I'm not, I'm not tracking that particular analytic. Okay. But Cox, you can get it. You can get it from Cox. I'm, uh, Martha. I'm pretty okay. sure that we. So I'm pretty sure that we can. Right, I understand that it's not a part of our contract, but what I'm asking for is the data on how many families Cox is servicing under the partnership with Norfolk Public Schools and Cox Cable, and whether it has had a direct impact on the children who need the service between the partnership. That's what I'm... So who gets the data? It's, it's not the <coughs> so we don't get the data. So does Norfolk Public Schools get the data? No, this is a service that's just offered. Oh. What is it called? It's a Cox service that's offered out. They advertise it every year to the students, and then the students take it home, and they have to sign up for it, or the parents. Let's see if Norfolk Public Schools has the data, because it is a partnership, and we should be tracking it. I don't, I don't, um, Council, I don't think that we can um, get data from private deals. So when the parents go home, they have to call the number and sign up for it um, through their house, <coughs> through the school system. So they don't bring a form back to the school and say that we've signed up for it. It's right, but it is a partnership with Norfolk Public Schools. No, no. They, they just advertise no. to the it's, it's a business yeah, they relationship. They just, bring, they just, just give the flyers out and then we, we give it to the kids. Yeah. So it sounds like all we can do since we don't have it is to ask Cox. Yeah, ask Cox how many kids. It's active participation okay. by the parents to, okay. to sign up. They do it in several communities across mm -hmm. the country for small, for low income families. Right. But I still think it's uh, 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 a business offering mm -hmm. that, you know, they're able to, you know, do it that way. Okay, this, this slide is sort of a bottom line up front of what we're doing and what we plan to do, and so I'm going to touch lightly on this slide. Uh, there'll be much more detail in the, in the coming slides, but uh, these are four areas that we can influence uh, and, uh, and drive increased accessibility of broadband and other uh, services to our citizens. So for residents, uh, we provided, we talked about this, we provided free public Wi-Fi in city libraries for several years now. Uh, we're in the process of expanding, uh, as I said, free public Wi-Fi, and we're, we're looking at piloting a couple of neighborhood projects in terms of, um, of Wi-Fi capability, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, business is very important. We, I believe the city has expanded the pool of contractors who are coming into the city, a number of, of, of co companies coming in offering fiber. We're, we're able to facilitate that process through our right-of-way uh, responsibility that we have. And also, we'll be able to use this fiber again, as I said earlier, to leverage uh, uh, relationships with other com uh, companies. Um, really proud of this next one. We'll talk more about that, but we, we, we're beginning to expand access of free public Wi-Fi in targeted downtown and business corridors, and we'll talk about the importance of that a little later. In terms of city services and school, we've just recently negotiated with Cox and received basically quadrupled our internet speed with savings of about $25,000 a year. So it's not so much the savings as the fact that we're going to be able to go from 200 megabits to one gig 
of, um, of internet capability on, on, on our network. The schools were able to leverage the same contract as a result of our good work and saved about $50,000. Um, and as we move forward, um, see real opportunity for the city and the schools to partner and leverage this infrastructure that we're going to build out. And we'll talk about that a, a little more in, in a few minutes. I'm also excited about um, we're in the process of forming a working group that will be comprised of both a business and a community uh, element that will help us uh, with our strategic partner to develop a long-term uh, strategy for broadband. We're going to have the infrastructure in place that will be good for 15 to 20 years, but this team, uh, will, and we're working with um, Dominion Enterprises, we're working with the military, uh, NRH, we're working with um, multiple businesses, Norfolk School Board, and so I think this will be a team of experts that will be able to help us put together a long-term plan that will be good for the city, both from a terms of city government, residents, and business. So um, first I want to th say thanks to the council for approving this particular project in the 2017 budget, the expanding the city broadband accessibility and capability. Why is this important to the city? You probably saw a similar map from another city a few weeks ago, but basically in, in 2005, the city planned and implemented <coughs> a broadband infrastructure around the perimeter of the city. And you can see uh, see that on the map with a, with a leg going up towards um, Pretlow Library and, and um, Ocean View. We'll be, we'll be building that out. But basically, this network was built in 2005. It's a combination of city-owned and leased fiber, leased fiber from Cox, with strategic uh, switches that connect our key mission-critical areas, public safety buildings, schools, and, and, and otherwise. So, um, again, the importance of, of this is that Norfolk has really been leading the way from a technology standpoint for over 10 years now. And by refreshing uh, and rebuilding this fiber network, we will uh, provide opportunities to connect communities. We'll talk about that, position the city for economic development, and facilitate partnerships with higher education and other schools. So, so the boundaries don't go into, unless I'm missing it, campus of Berkeley. Uh, See where the boundary stuff. Yes, sir. Am the, I missing that? We're going to talk about that in a minute in terms of Wi-Fi capability. But th yes, th the, this particular INET connects the major mission critical facilities within the city. So it's really going to be aligned with police, fire, uh, schools for eventual use, um, libraries, libraries. Right. But but again, this is not in the, you know. But again, this would be the major skeleton. There's going to be a lot of capillaries and other, you know, elements that, that branch out. We currently lease. Uh, it is a lot of connectivity within this block with leased fiber, so that, that'll continue. There's, this is basically what the, the built-out um, skeleton will look like. And will it be with all libraries for the, the city? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, that's why this particular one will go up, it's going up Chesapeake. <coughs> With so, so we have a brand new school coming over. What am I missing? That um, we have a brand new school coming over at uh, Campus Stella, and um, I guess I'm, I guess what concerns me is that the boundaries that you you show it cuts off a whole segment of southern segment of the city. Um, Maybe I'm. Sir, sure, there's there's fiber going across that bridge right there, going across to Campus Stella. Uh -huh. It's just not on the main INET ring. Which connects these main nodes, which is in the middle of the city. So, there what does that do in regard? And see, so you're talking to a dinosaur now. But what does that do in regards to broadband and all of that? It's, it's over there. It's coming across on a separate fiber on its own. It's just not on that main okay. ring, which connects all the major cities' nodes, right. such as EOC, uh, those in, uh, the City Hall, Ramsey Municipal Buildings. Those, that's what really that, that, that circle is all about. Okay, so, so one of the opportunities we have, I mentioned partnering with the public schools. The public schools lease their own fiber from Cox. I believe that this strategic plan would, would position us to be in a place where we could very easily connect schools to our fiber at reduced cost, but we're not there yet. I mean, that would be the vision, sir, whether it's any new schools. They're currently running their own fiber to, their, to the new schools. Well, politically, frankly, you should have done a better. Not, I'm not indicting anybody, but Chip, you should have done a better job of showing something. Yeah, I think we're, we're that's really, I think really yeah. 
they got ocean done. view. Thank you. It's usually leaving us off, so they they, they got us pumped. Understood. I feel your pain. Okay, so a real opportunity exists to increase connectivity through the use of free public Wi-Fi. And there are a number of benefits to Wi-Fi, including increased traffic to local businesses. It, it's going to make us more attractive to future residents and businesses. It supports our smart city initiatives, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in another slide. It also provides, we're working with Fest Events, DNC, and others uh, to provide a city uh, branding and advertising platform. So we are partnering uh, with those folks um, in, in downtown and other areas. And so I think we're going to do some really smart things there. Um, so how are we going to implement this? We've got a two-phase strategy. The first phase is currently underway, and I'm, I'm proud to restate and reiterate that two weeks ago, uh, the city, in, in partnership with Dominion Resources and DNC, uh, went with free public Wi-Fi at MacArthur Square uh, Station and uh, passed out some cards there on connectivity. Uh, and that really is a good, good thing in that it, it will give <coughs> us uh, an opportunity to observe how that works, look at things like wayfinding, folks coming in off ships will be able to direct people to uh, various um, landmarks in the city. So we're really using that as, as, a, as an incubator, if you will. And we're in the process of uh, building, gonna be building a network for free public Wi-Fi around the entire waterfront, basically from south of the Pagoda to the Waterside District. Um, and, and again, we're partnering with uh, DNC Fest Events and others uh, in terms of how we would use that for branding, um, helping <laughs> citizens, businesses, uh, tourists, and, and, and otherwise. So we're really, really excited about that. So that covers the business side. How about some of the neighborhoods that we talked about? Um, we have a real opportunity uh, playing off our network that I showed you to, to, to expand Wi-Fi in public spaces and so I'm really <coughs> pleased to announce that we are now partnering with WHRO uh, to provide free, free Wi-Fi in early fall in the Park Place uh, community. And so what does that mean? Um, we're going to use the wireless technology similar to, to MacArthur Square, but we'll, we'll be able to access 7,800 si simultaneous users will be able to access that Wi-Fi in the Park Place um, community. Um, which is, which is to the point you made, but I think a really big deal. And we're looking at at least two other uh, communities in the coming year. So, so, so again, uh, explain to me about the boundaries and, and why the, um, the south side is not in that boundary. I mean, and that looks like that's probably one of the only areas that's not in the boundary. I'm looking on the yes, sir. west and some of, uh, around maybe parts of Lambert's Point, I see 38 to 48th Street. Right. And that bound is. So, Mr. Riddick, I'll, I'll try, and um, because they have to educate me also. So, they built a ring. So, a ring is a ring is a ring. So, they could have put, can you go back to the slide, yes, Stan? Um, the, the, the ring could have been, you know, here, or, so the ring, but that's not it. So after that, the ring is going to have, whether you call them capillaries or veins or arteries that go throughout the entire sure. city. So a better, we could have just gone to, how do you stay connected throughout the city? So there's no way in the world the south side is going to be disconnected from, from the site. Did I get that Correct. right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All you got, a ring is a ring is a ring. Unless it's not. <laughs> Okay, so Norfolk is a smart city and getting smarter every day. What, what does that mean? What does a smart city mean? Basically, a smart city leverages technology to enhance city services, and it's data-driven, so we will use anal analytics to actually provide better services, smarter services to our residents. So that's what smart city is, is, is all about. Um, and we're beginning to leverage existing applications and actually bringing new on, online. As a matter of fact, George, in a, in a few minutes, will be briefing you on an online permitting system, which is, gets to the heart of smart city processing. Uh, we have smart parking meters. Uh, we have Storm and Titan that are used in, in t terms of uh, natural uh, disasters and events, and many more utilities, um, um, uh, energy consumption. Um, and this is really a big deal for the city. Um, at the same time that we're doing all this, I wanted to mention this because I know it's something that bec only becomes an issue when it becomes an issue, and that's cybersecurity. Cyber I want to assure you that the city is taking 
uh, the necessary technological safeguards to protect your data. Um, you know, we're using best industry standards, antivirus filtering, and other software. The thing that we want to concentrate on in the coming year is leading a cultural change where we have our, our employees and, and users of our system better user awareness and a team approach to security. I was on a panel recently, a regional panel on cybersecurity, and you know, the, the issue really is not if we will be breached, but, but when. And so we have business continuity plans in place, and that's going to be a really important thing in terms of how, how would we recover in the event of, a, of an issue. So again, the city is really leading the region in technological innovation, and how are we doing this? We're doing this through an enhanced and scalable fiber ring that we talked about. We've expanded our access to public Wi-Fi, and again, we're one of the uh, first cities in the region um, that has free Wi-Fi in public venues. If you look at the technical um, magazines, they always bring up Seattle, uh, Kansas City, and there was just a recent article where Kansas City said, hey, we got a great idea, we're gonna have public Wi-Fi. Well, I want you to know that Norfolk is there also, and we're excited about that. Um, this was a big deal. Uh, it, just a few months ago, we were named Virginia's uh, 2015 Google City winner, uh, and this is really for strength of businesses accessing uh, computer computers in their in their day to day life. And 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 Google actually called us a digital city. That is one of the uh, you know the main factors in, in, in that award. <coughs> And I'm also happy to say that in the fall, September time frame, the city is going to host a Smart City Symposium in conjunction uh, with Microsoft and other vendors. And so we're going to uh, really get after that, and I think it will pay, uh, pay dividends for us. I just have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, Google and Microsoft both, if I'm not mistaken, have um, grants and programs that they fund for cities that are working to get either broadband or Wi-Fi into neighborhoods um, that are low to moderate income or that are um, subject to the digital divide. Are we able, because of these designations and all these wonderful things, are we able to go after any of that money or is that something totally separate? That, that could be an outcome. We were ab able to access Microsoft through Christine and the Resilient City 100 uh, because they're a major player in that, and so we've started to talk to them. They're helping us with cybersecurity and uh, smart city. They call it ne Next City. Um, that could be an outcome, but it's not something I've talked to them about. Google's a totally different uh, animal. They basically pick a city strategically. They come in and say, get out of the way. We're going to lay our fiber and their benefits to residents is primarily not used for, for city business. Um, we've talked to Google. I've told them strategically we appear to be just north and east of Charlotte and Raleigh, but um, we're, we haven't made a lot of progress there yet. So moving forward, we, we constantly want to look at balancing, um, lowering the cost of, of uh, internet for our businesses, for the city, and for residents while increasing the uh, access to those products and services. So how we're going to lower costs, we will we'll continue to build out our city-owned infrastructure. Again, um, the fiber that we own keeps us from leasing it. The first year, we're going to save about $200,000 through the project that you funded. Um, we're going to renegotiate the Cox Franchise Agreement, and we're, we continue to attract new providers. The more fiber we own, the more companies will be interested in us because we can share that. And, and how do we, in the long term, short term, increase accessibility? Um, we talked about uh, developing a long term strategy via the working group and our strategic consultant. Um, we will have, the, the city will have the infrastructure in place that will be good for 15 to 20 years. This team will allow us to develop and utilize this in the best way f uh, for, for the city. Uh, I think we have to continue to explore regional partnerships. It makes sense to talk to our sister cities about how to partner and connect with them. And I think we're going to continue to leverage wireless internet technology. I'm meeting with one of, uh, one of the uh, prime vendors here in two weeks to talk about 5G technology and how that can help the city from a wireless perspective. And we'll continue to discuss best practices with other cities in the region. So that, that concludes my presentation. If there are questions, yes, sir, um, I know um, talking about boards and commissions is a sensitive issue right now. 
but um, the last meeting I had discussed the IT Commission. Um, I think that now more than ever that we've moved forward with this budget item um, of $4 million in expanding this, that we need to have ambassadors out there pretty much similar to what we did with the bike um, and trails and that we have a group of citizens that we appoint that can be out there speaking to civic leagues, that can be a point of contact for us, for you to use to throw things off of. And I'm hoping that um, we can get that established sooner than later. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to wait till the new council fall, but um, if it's something that you believe in too, that we can start at least looking for sure. people that may want to serve on that. Get rid of one. Okay. Add a new one. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Steve. Thanks a lot. That was really good. <coughs> um, Mr. Mayor, members of council, you have my my PowerPoint in your Dropbox, so I'm not going to attempt to go through the whole thing. Social. Okay. Um, as part of the uh, Smart City, Smart Processing initiative um, that was begun about four years ago, um, one of the latest components of this is what we call Smart Permitting, uh, which is a cloud-based permits management system that it will be shared by planning, neighborhood development, um, and various um, other entities and agencies who need to, to be able to tie into the building permits and, and the um, enforcement modules. Um, the beginning rollout of this has been set for the 5th of July um, for the first phase. Um, we're going to do this in a phased approach. So the first phase is the basic module um, where people will actually be able to obtain permits. Um, we'll be able to schedule inspections and, um, and manage things through the portal. Um, the next phase will allow for a complete online application of, for permits. Uh, we're going to roll this out through the rest of the year just to make sure that each phase works and people are comfortable with it um, before moving on to, to the next phase. The reason we need to talk about this today um, is that at your next meeting, you'll consider some changes to the fee schedule that um, will allow for this, process, this system to work. Um, and um, we currently have a, um, a rather Byzantine fee structure. Um, that actually requires you to submit your plans and have them reviewed before we can determine what your fee could possibly be because it's through the review process that we determine what your building classification and fire rating classification are, and that's what goes into the, um, the system. So that's the current table. Um, that's what you have to, to navigate through. And what we want to do is go to a simple 15 cent a square foot uh, for residential, um, 16 cent a square foot for commercial um, and what that basically does is keep everything more or less exactly in line with with where we are today um, some fees are not going to change at all um, and others <coughs> as you can see the magnitude of change um, is is basically insignificant let me make perfectly clear nobody makes a choice about whether to build or not build in the city of Norfolk because the building permit cost $46.66 more or less than it, it once did. Um, now, if these were hundreds of dollars, then that might be a difference. But in, you know, in this case, this, this is almost a, a rounding error for, for the most part. Um, so you will have this in front of you on the 14th. Um, and um, we have already started the, the testing. Uh, we have tablets in the field with our inspectors, both in neighborhood development as well as in planning. Um, and um, as I mentioned, we're we'll be rolling this out starting the 5th of July to the public. Um, as part of that, um, you know, you've got that in your, as, as part of the rollout, um, we're doing a number of things with the help of our marketing office. Um, we're going to have a, a mailer that's going to go out to everybody who's done business with the city for permits. Um, and we have a really cool video. Later this summer, a new process will allow residents and commercial builders 
simpler, faster, and more efficient access to construction permits in Norfolk. This effort called Smart Permitting is just the latest in a series of city initiatives to streamline and improve customer service here in Norfolk. Over the last few years, we have introduced electronic submission for site and building plans and provided online access to permit information. This spring, building and code inspectors began using tablets to increase efficiency, enhance public safety, and just generally make life better here in Norfolk. Smart permitting will allow automation of permits, inspection, and code enforcement, as well as online payments. It will also greatly simplify the fee structure. 15 cents per square foot for residential construction and 16 cents per square foot for commercial. Compare that to this. Some fees will increase, some will decrease, and some will stay the same. One thing that will definitely change, it will be easier to get stuff done. Props, props to Brent and the, uh, the, the marketing office. for That's great. Are we going to um, monitor this as far as use and, and how people are satisfied with it? And, you know, I think it would be really interesting for us to have an update on it. Yeah, we're going to, you know, as part of this whole thing, process, I mean, the process improvement is what this is all about. Yeah. And we're going to continue to, you know, engage in continuous process improvement. So, yeah, we'll find out what people like. Um, some things will be easy to tweak. Some things we may have to, to help them understand can't be tweaked. But we can... We're going to try to make this easy for the customers. It is a customer-focused um, initiative, um, and that will also hopefully make it easier for the staff as well. Okay, we got to go. Thank you. Well, um, Marcus, the presentation on the rentals, I think Adam's probably doing it in his sleep. It's been moved now through three meetings. Can we make sure it's first? Yeah. When do we meet again? In two weeks? 14. 14.